Good morning, my beloved, and thank you. Thank you for coming in today. And I know that the, we've heard this before, but it, it's, it's real. Our, our, as you know, the ecclesiastical year begins in September. That's the way it was from way, way back. And it makes a lot of sense when you think about it, why September is considered the beginning of the new year. Back in those days and back in, in, a, in a society that was very much based on an agrarian cycle, for those Clemson people who know better than I do, uh, that means that it had to do with farming, had to do with land, had to do with tilling, had to do with harvesting. And this is the time that people would be harvesting. And this is what we're celebrating uh, in, from the early times. And uh, of course, January later became the beginning of the year. But we're starting out a new year in the ecclesiastical sense. And seeing you here, seeing being with you um, is emotional for me because we're getting back on schedule again, thank God. But it's also an opportunity to get to share so much and we're hoping that we get to continue to share a number of various things that are going to be coming up. Good things, good things. Speaking of good things, today we heard the first Sunday of Luke. You, those of you that picked up your missile, the little uh, guide that you pick up, many of you pick up when you come earlier in the morning through the narthex, and that takes some effort, and we appreciate some people in our parish that are dedicating their time and their efforts and their talents to putting together the missile, the daily missile, the bulletin that you see, and other uh, communications that go out during, even during the week. And we're very appreciative of those individuals and for their talents. Today's gospel lesson had to do the beginning of Christ, after the beginning of Christ's ministry, but he's going around and he is deciding who he wants to be with him, who he wants to be his disciples. Now, this is, even though it's the fifth chapter of Luke, this is talking about the beginning of the choosing of the disciples. And I'd like to touch on a little part of it. It's just a small part of it, but it's, it's, it's so impactful, it is so it hits so hard that it, it hits 2,000 years later with the same punch, the same power that it did when Christ first uttered those words. You remember the story is Jesus was standing by the, by the lake there, Lake Yenisaret, and he saw two boats. But the fishermen had gone out of the boats because it appears well, we found out later it was not a very successful um, fishing trip for them. And these are the people that totally depend on the fish for their money. They totally depend, their life, their family's life depended on what kind of catch they made from the night before. Roof over their heads, clothes on their backs, food on their table, literally. So they went out, and it happened to be the, the boat of Simon Peter. Christ had come into Simon's uh, attention a bit earlier, too, but no formal commitments had been made on one side or the other yet. So he, it says that Christ got into the boat, sat in it, and he taught. He taught about God's mercy, God's love, God's involvement, God's caring. To God, I mean something. Even though I'm that proverbial little speck in the sand on some far, far distant beach somewhere, that little speck of sand, me, I, I mean something to God. Sometimes I have problems, I have the problems recognizing that but God doesn't have a problem recognizing me. Another story. So after he had finished 
teaching Jesus, he said to Simon, Simon, put out into the deep and let your nets out for a catch. In other words, why don't you go back out? Now this is after they have spent all night out and they caught nothing. And they had to come in and with nothing to show for their efforts, nothing to show for their efforts, they were washing their nets. Why were they washing their nets? Because this was their livelihood. Whether they caught tons of fish or they caught zero fish, they had to take care of their supplies, their equipment. If they did not take care of their equipment, their nets, there wasn't going to be a tomorrow for them to catch fish. Nets were expensive. They needed the equipment. They needed to keep it to up. And it's almost like adding, <laughs> adding salt to the wound. We got nothing and yet we're going to have to spend a lot of time out here cleaning out our nets, which was a thankless job. Simon said, Master, we toiled all night and yet we took nothing but at your word. I will let down the nets. And we read afterwards, obviously, that after this had happened, they not only fished, but they caught so much fish, so many fish, that they couldn't even handle the catch. Their blessings, their catch, their livelihood increased immensely by that one decision made by this man, Simon Peter. That one. That one. Here we go again. Peter. He's the one, you remember, we've talked about him over and over and over. Peter is the one who kind of shoots from the hip, shoots before he thinks, shoots before he aims. Not because he is a hothead. Well, take it back. He's a hothead. But not because he's a bad hothead, or not because he's trying to cause problems. It's because that's who he is. That's his personality. And when you look at it, God, through Jesus the Christ, must have known that because Peter ended up being the leader, or the spokesman, I should say, for all the disciples this hothead, this shoot-from-the-hip individual. But he had something more in him, too. He had passion. The passion is what Christ wanted to bridle, to bring into his ministry, because he needed that. The passion. Not this lackadaisical, oh yeah, well, that's okay, it's not today, we, you know, we'll try it again tomorrow, type of thing. Peter was one of those people that, bam, it hit. When he did something, it seems that he did it with all of his might, with all of his soul. Did he make mistakes? Absolutely he made mistakes. This is where I'm going. I've been blessed many years to be able to do what I'm doing, to stand here unworthily and to try to tell other people about this God. The same God that I often fight with. Same God that I wrestle with. Same God that I sometimes yell at. Same God that I, in my frustration at times, say, Where have you been? Why haven't things been a little different? 
Why hasn't it been different in my life? Why hasn't it been different in my family's life? Why hasn't it been different for my loved ones, for my, my parish? Why hasn't it been different for the world? Look, look what's going on, God. Where are you? That God. And I'm supposed to tell you how good he is. In my weak moments, in my moments of despair, I find it difficult, just like probably most of you. What I'm trying to say, I am no different than you. I have my moments, my good moments, and my not so good moments. And it those, it's those not so good moments that oftentimes, ironically, that I learn the most from. I've shared with you over the years, both in a corporate setting, a liturgy, but also privately when we talk and when we share as two human beings. I say then something that I've found over the years and it is so, so true. I am the sum total of my life's experiences up to and including this very moment. Everything that has happened to me, good things and not good things. Everything that has happened to me in my years on this earth have put me where I am, right here, right now. Decisions I've made, some good decisions and some not good decisions. Peter, at that moment, at that point in his life, Peter could have turned around to this Jesus. He didn't know that much, but an important part here. Remember, Jesus had done something right before this happened. What, did, what happened right before this exchange between Peter and Jesus? What happened? Jesus taught. Jesus shared. Jesus explained. Jesus told the people about this God. The good part here is Peter, even in his frustration, ah, working all night, nothing to pull in. You know, what's my family going to eat today? But even then, in his frustration, bashing the nets on the, on the stones to try to clean out the all the dirty water and so forth so he can have something to go fish later that night, later the day, in the evening. He was still listening. A very important point. Even when I am down, even when I am in despair, even when I don't want to, maybe especially when I don't want to, I still have to keep my antenna up. I still have to try to keep my heart open. I still have to be able to listen. Because if I don't, all that, that has happened, all the mistakes, all the wrong decisions that I have made, all of that, if I'm not listening, if I'm not learning, then what the heck good was it? That's the point God can allow me if this stubborn, egotistical mind and this hard, uh, egotistical heart will just open up some to hear something good that I can learn from this. I learned not to do that. when I make a mistake. 
realizing and recognizing that I did make a mistake. And it's my fault, not God's fault. He gave me a free will. And I'd be among the first to yell and scream at him, God, if he tried to do anything about taking away my free will. But he won't because he promised he would not. And he keeps his promises. I don't. He does. Decisions. Decisions we make affect us. If it's a good decision, great. We go on. And we try to follow the same pattern. But what about the wrong decisions that I make? Peter could have said, no, we wouldn't be reading about Peter today if Peter had said, are you kidding? Who are you? You're a carpenter. What are you telling me, a fisherman? You're telling me? I'm the expert, not you. That's what he could have said. And who would have argued with him? Anybody hearing him would have said, yeah, yeah, attaboy, Peter, you let him know. But Peter somehow swallowed some of that egotistical pride. He said, you know, just maybe, maybe somebody really does care. Maybe, maybe this God, ah, uh, maybe. So what have I got to lose? So what if I open this a little bit? What if I open this a little bit? Maybe I will be able to learn from this mistake that I made, or in my case, mistakes, plural, that I make. Peter, again. Good old Peter. This is why I love him so much. Because he is who he is. And because so often I find myself in his obnoxious, self-centered responses. I'd like to think is because I realize in my good moments this God does care. This God does love. And this God does want to help me. I have to do something too, though. I have to do something. He'll do most of the work, but he expects me to get off of my duff and work and help him, show him that I believe in what I'm doing. What we saw is when Peter listened, he received blessings far beyond he ever imagined. I say for myself, I've seen blessings far beyond I had ever hoped for. May God give us the, the courage, the wisdom, and the desire to keep ourselves somewhat open to Him and to the many blessings that He is wishing, wanting, waiting to throw out on me. Amen.